Hello and welcome to this week's edition of 50 Years Serving the Island, a series of programmes showcasing highlights from Manx Radio's archives during the station's first five decades serving the public in the Isle of Man. In 1968, Manx Radio was transferred into public ownership to become the island's public service broadcaster. This week we go back almost 30 years to a special edition of Mandate, looking at the history of one of the island's most historic landmarks, Bishop's Court. This programme was presented by David Collister and Paul Moulton and was broadcast in July 1989. It's believed that Bishop's Court in its original form was built by Bishop Simon of Argyle, who served between 1226 and 1247. We'll hear shortly about some of the bishops to occupy the house up to 1979, when the Right Reverend Vernon Nichols decided he didn't wish to live there. The last bishop to live in Bishop's Court was in fact Bishop Eric Gordon, who was married in the chapel at Bishop's Court many years previously. In a Manx radio program in 1967, he recalled the event. My wife and I have been away from the island for some years. We used to live here. We were married here. In fact, we were married in what is now my own chapel at Bishop's Court. And we were married by one of my predecessors, Bishop Stanton Jones. Coming back after a lapse of years, we've now had 15 months in the island. And 1967 has been an exciting year for us. We are often asked how we find the island. Well, in many respects, we find it unchanged. The same kindly, genial ways, the same unhurried pace, the same regard for orderly, decent living without undue interference by authority, and, of course, the same wonderful beauty of mountain, glen and shore. Though this must be said, there's no doubt that we must watch this beauty very carefully and see that developments by individuals don't mar what rightly belongs to all. This preservation of God-given beauty is, I believe, a Christian concern. In other ways, there is change. More general prosperity, perhaps with smaller congregations in churches. The farms and pastures in particularly good heart the valuable growth of mixed industry, new efforts to meet the changing demands of visitors, and, of course, the very considerable influx of new residents. This we see as we return, and, of course, much more. What has given me most joy as bishop in 1967 has been the foundation of the new Isle of Man Council of Churches, representative of all the major Christian churches, Free Church, Anglican and Roman Catholic. Never before has there been such a friendly spirit and such awareness of our common task. Well, there's been a long and interesting line of bishops living at Bishop's Court, and Charles Gard spoke to Anne Harrison of the Manx Museum about some of the more notable ones. Well, we're sitting in a very secluded part of Bishop's Court Garden here today with the sun shining and the birds singing. And it really does seem a very pleasant place to live, but I don't think it's always been like that. With me is Anne Harrison, who's done a great deal of research into the bishops that have lived here, their lifestyle and their families. And what do we know about the early bishops? Of course, at that time, uh, it was pre-Reformation, they were Catholic bishops, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't have had a family. No, no, you're thinking in terms of a celibate household, uh, the bishop with his own clergyman, of course, and obviously servants, servants from the, from the locality. Uh, but as it's an unrecorded part of our history, we can't really say anything about them in detail. We can say they wouldn't have had a bombing range in the background, which is <laughs> what we can hear from over there at the moment. But yeah. uh, what, what were some of the characters that lived here, the, the early bishops? Who stands out in your research? Well, the, the, the man, um, the first bishop, Bishop John Duncan, whom Frank's been talking about, who built the gatehouse, uh, we have to think he was a Manxman, 
and in fact he went to Avignon to receive his, his consecration at the hands of the Pope. Then he came back and held his first high mass at the cathedral on St. Patrick's Isle. So that's rather an exciting sort of memory. Would all Manx bishops of that period have gone to receive their consecration from the Pope personally? Oh no, not necessarily. There'd be a, a sort of fail-safe uh, administrative procedure because to go away uh, across the seas was highly dangerous and highly expensive so there'd be arrangements for, for officials to take these parts from time to time. Not all the bishops of course spent all their episcopacy here resident on the Isle of Man did they? No I'm afraid they didn't. Uh, the, in the early times um, bishops who were given the bishop of the Isle of Man if they had other uh, preferments and if they had other you know curacies or whatever they often preferred to stay on the other side of the Irish Sea and come, you know, very occasionally to mm. the island. It was Bishop Phillips, the Welshman, who started to translate the prayer book, I think, into Manx Gaelic. That was the first time that happened. Yes, it's the first written Manx. He, he actually did spend quite a deal of time on the island, whether it was his Celtic background, but he really cared about the island and was very concerned that, uh, that the population should have something in their own language. We do read, though, of bishops coming here and finding not only bishops' court, but the state of the Manx clergy and the people themselves in a parlous and dejected state. One of those, of course, was the most famous of them all, Bishop Wilson, who was here for many years, I think over 50 years, and died here mm -hmm. in his 90s. Now, why do you think he stayed for all that time? He must have been a very pious and hard-working man. Oh, yes, he was. He was the model of 18th century bishops, actually. He was a man revered by, his, by the clergy for his high-mindedness and his simplicity of living. He was really a very great man. And actually, unlike Bishop Barrow, who was one of his predecessors, who found them a, a barbarous, violent, and generally totally degenerate set of people, he said they were an orderly, civilized people and courteous enough to strangers. And he put really all his, in, his energies into being a good bishop. And he stayed here 55 years, of course and was very much venerated by the people. There was one bishop later than that, though, who was related to uh, one of the Dukes of Athol. He didn't get on so well, did he? What was that to do with taxes? Was it a potato tax? Well, it was all about the tithes, you know, the, the, the tenth of, uh, of the income of, cro of crops, uh, fish in the sea, all sorts of things, and, and the uh, parishioners had to pay these back to um, the, the tithe owners and the bishop and he inf he was actually extending the tithe at a time when in fact it was beginning to wane you know it wasn't regarded as a, a payment that people liked to make anymore he was extending it to green crops and potatoes just at the wrong moment and he of course had to meet the fury of the mob who marched on bishop's court with a, a bloody ensign so he was in fact related to the dukes of Athol and he made his way with his family uh, scurried back to Castlemona for uh, refuge and eventually he went off to Rochester but he did do an awful lot to the house and the grounds. The Duke of Athol as you say his relation had built the mm. castle Mona. Mm. the fury of the mob there now that wasn't just a small demonstration that was quite um, quite a gathering how many thousand came? Well there were several thousand I think uh, you know the mob I mean the people were alerted in all places of the island. It was quite a nation, an, an island-wide mm. movement, and oh, they they really they really meant business. I suppose like the Cossacks, uh, people that were uh, you know going to go against the um, enclosure of the Commons. Later, there was one bishop who uniquely held the position as bishop and governor. Now that must have put him into a very very powerful position. Yeah, yes, he was. That was Bishop Barrow, the sword bishop, and he was both bishop and governor for eight years and he was the man who really was rather horrified by the Manx you know loose vicious rude and barbarous no sense of religion incapable of being bettered <laughs> well it was up to him surely to do something about it well yes he did he, he, he did try he wanted to improve our educational systems both at an elementary and and a higher level um, and of course Bishop Barrow it's part of his foundation is is, is part of the King Williams College foundation now and, and through the academic sort of training of clergymen. Um, yes, he did his best. He, he organized the finances of the, of the bishopric as well and he to provide for um, better wages for the clergy. So he did his best. He really felt, you know, he was driven to do something very pretty, pretty serious. There was an ambivalent attitude to 
uh, John Wesley, when he, when he came here on both his visits, he was ignored by bishops the first time and, and welcomed the second time, but there was also an ambivalent attitude towards the Manx language, wasn't there? We've heard of uh, John Phillips, who encouraged it, but there were other bishops who really did want to get rid of it. And in fact, one bishop's wife held her sides with laughter every time she heard somebody speak Manx. Yes, it seems to go alternately for every bishop, Rick. Uh, bishop Barrow thought English had to be the way. Um, then there was a, a, a sort of bishoprics of episcopates, I should say, where people didn't really want to come, so there was a, a hiatus. Bishop Wilson um, th thought in terms of uh, the Manx language because he, in fact, translated his principles and duties of Christianity into Manx, and that was really the start of a Manx um, ecclesiastical piece of work for the Manx people. Um, but Hildersley, who was really uh, a great man, actually he, he in fact did bring about the translation of the Bible into Manx, but his wife never appreciated the Manx and used to hold her sides with laughter when she heard the jabbering of the people around Coat Michael anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so from a fortified medieval tower, which was a retreat really from the, for the bishop because his cathedral was on uh, St. Patrick's Isle, it turned eventually into quite a commodious family house. Yes, um, Bishop Wilson obviously made it better and planted trees and, and, and enlarged the gardens and, and, and farmed the Demean Farm uh, in a very uh, business-like way. Bishop Hildersley was the same sort of person, improving the gardens. Uh, Claudius Criggan, he did, did extensive alterations, as Frank has said, to the house and, and, the, and the fabric of the chapel, actually. And then he, in fact, had a large family. They had a very pleasant house. But actually, Bishop Murray, who was a man of... Uh, very expensive and um, tastes. Mm. His wife didn't think it was really very good, so he did an awful lot more. And the gardens were meant to be really very, very fine in his day. Former MHK Miss Jean Thornton Dewsbury lived at Bishop's Court as a small girl on account of her father being the island's Lord Bishop. That was between 1925 and 1928 and she well remembers parties of people arriving there by train for functions and as tourists as she recalls for Charles Guard. In those days the Bishop was able to have a staff in the house therefore we had big garden parties and also we um, employed Collinsons and had a huge marquee on the lawn. Well, this made several hundred people. And although some would come by cars, a great many came uh, from the train, uh, which stopped the bottom of a field just below Bishop's Court, between Bishop's Court and Oddersdale. As far as I remember, there was no halt sign of Bishop's Court. I don't remember that. And there was no seat there, I don't think. I think there was just a, a level part where you got out. <laughs> and I suppose today, with all the thoughts of insurance and things like this, it would be considered a very dangerous operation. But I never remember anybody even spraining an ankle. And um, I imagine the guard just held people back until the train had gone. Then they came across party shoes and all the rest of it across the line and up a little path up the side of the field there was a little footpath uh, with a ditch on one side and then they got to a little swing gate uh, into, into Bishop's Court where they came in at the bottom of what's called the Bishop Wilson Walk which is the one facing you when you go in at the main gate and they would come up there. Then especially big parties we held once or twice when we had the homecomers when a ship was chartered, I understand, and, and people uh, who had Manx connections came back to see the land of their forebears, and uh, the houses round about in the Isle of Man entertained them, and Bishop's Court did. And then we had several hundred came, and they came by train mainly. Delightful time it was, because my mother had a great feeling that they should also go into the house. And one American lady, I remember saying, this is lovely. We've been entertained at Government House and at Cronkburn, the speakers, and all the different houses. But we've always been in the garden, and we've never been asked into a house until this point. But they came by train. <laughs> now, uh, your father also was very uh, tolerant and kind to the tourists, because in the tourist season, he personally uh, showed them round the glen. Yes. Every Tuesday, 
uh, during the season, um, Bishop's Court was open for tourists and a great many people came. And of course, quite a lot who had known my father in previous parishes about in Barrow in Furness and in London. We usually had about 200 on a Tuesday and they came by train and then my father would show them around the grounds and up the glen and then into the chapel and usually have a, a hymn and a prayer if you could get hold of somebody who could play the organ and postcards were sold. I used to be in charge of the postcards and my father used to sign them for people who bought them. Jean Thornton Dewsbury. You're listening to 50 Years Serving the Island a series of programmes showcasing highlights from Manx Radio's archives during the station's first five decades serving the public in the Isle of Man. Today we're revisiting a special edition of Mandate, looking at the history of Bishop's Court. Presented by David Collister and Paul Moulton, the programme was broadcast in July 1989. Now we continue our look at Bishop's Court. Visitors to the house can obtain a new illustrated guide which has been prepared by the editor of Manx Life, Ian Folds. Ian's interest in the house extends back for many years and he's a real enthusiast for it. Here we are surrounded by over 700 years of history and I think probably most people thinking about a bishop's residence would think it was very stiff and formal and you know, not much to tell about it. In fact, quite the contrary, there's everything here from a castle right through to 19th century building works and the people who've lived in it, of course, have varied <laughs> quite considerably. When did you first become interested in it? Many years ago, um, before, in fact, the, the bishops had given up living at Bishop's Court, in my view, it's one of the most fascinating buildings on the island, particularly because of the continuity of uh, habitation here. Which parts of the building do you find most interesting? Well, I think probably where we're standing now, David, you can see part of the original Peel Tower, which exhibits a considerable amount of building work. You can actually see where the original building was um, and where windows have been inserted, different building lines have, uh, have happened. I, I think, uh, you know, probably for me that is the most interesting part. The building itself almost tells a story from the various changes in its, uh, in its pattern, I suppose, its That's exterior. Right. And I think also the parts of the building that you can no longer see. Um, for example, on the other side of the house where the, the old medieval chapel was. Um, the only survival from that, as far as I know, is the stained glass in the window in the hall. Now, it has had, obviously, periods of decay over the centuries. Um, well, what's happened there? I mean, uh, has one bishop blamed another bishop for leaving it in a, in a bad state, or what? I think that's probably, probably it. Um, in fact, I understand that the diocesan records are very much a record of one bishop coming along and complaining about what his predecessor did or, or didn't do. Then, on the other hand, you've also got um, quite a, a surprising number of fires which occurred here. Um, in fact, the last one in the 1890s, which virtually destroyed Bishop's Court. That fire, in fact, occurred on the 16th of May 1893, and the then bishop, uh, fortunately for Bishop's Court, was uh, Norman Stratton, who was obviously a man of some means, and he more or less single-handedly set about rebuilding the entire central part of the building. It, so it's surprising, in a way, that this building survived at all, perhaps? Is it? Oh, I think it is, yes. Um, and it's probably only because of, of the fact that it was housing the bishop, who for many centuries was also deputy governor, um, and therefore one of the most important people on the island. I think it's probably only because of that that the building has survived for so long. How do you assess the restoration work that Mr Fairhurst has carried out here in the past few years, then? absolutely stupendous. It's quite incredible. Anybody who went round Bishop's Court in the dark days before the building was actually sold will be absolutely astonished. And I, I can only recommend that you, you, anybody listening comes and sees for themselves because it, it is quite staggering. Um, inside one has a feeling of light and spaciousness 
The old Victorian um, decor has largely been replaced so that uh, there are now white walls, light wallpapers, uh, very tastefully decorated, all the cornices have been restored and I think as a whole it really is a, a fantastic house. Is it, has it been done in a way then that would have satisfied most of the bishops that lived here in the past would you say? I would think very much indeed. Bishop's Court has been substantially altered over the centuries to change it from a medieval tower and fortified home into the pleasant and commodious dwelling it is today. Charles Gard spoke to architect Frank Cowan about the history of the building. Well, Frank, it seems the building here can be divided into four periods, 14th century, pre-1650, 18th, early 19th century, and later than the 19th century. It's been lived in for about 700 years. We go back to the time of Bishop Simon at the end of the 14th century. What date do you think this central tower that we're looking at here is actually dated from? Well the tower is, is um, probably late 14th century. Bishop Simon was some time earlier than that. He was in the middle of the 1200s and he had, or the bishops, had lands at Ballacurry, which is this area at that time. Bishop Duncan is the one at the end of the 14th century who built we think this tower. It's similar to the gatehouse tower at Peel which was also reckoned to be built perhaps in the 1390s and the two buildings are very similar and are similar of course to the Peel towers that you get throughout the sort of Scottish border areas. The cement rendering that was once on this tower has been taken off in the last few months and that's very interesting because we can now see the slate and sandstone stone work and we can see the outlines of alterations that have been there uh, in previous times. Now what has been done to change this tower over the centuries? Well it was built as a fortified tower, a tower house with battlements which could be used for purposes of defence and the top wall itself was corbelled out, there were um, various chimneys on the end of it and it had a variety of small windows. By 1650 we know that it had, had added on to it on what I suppose is the north side, um, a medieval chapel and on the south side a hall because it was becoming by then domesticated people were wanting more living space the original tower house would have probably had a, a cellar or a storage room at ground level and the hall would have been above that with another floor on top of it as the years went on it became more and more domesticated this date of, of 1650 is perhaps an interesting one because that's the date at which we actually see the place for the first time through the Daniel King pictures and we have a pretty good record of, of what it looked like before that we've really no idea at all and then when time moves on we get Bishop Cregan who obviously wanted a much more domesticated house and he altered the tower itself. He altered it to make it look like a country house. He took the battlements off the top and the marks that you were referring to on the face of the tower that actually faces directly onto the main road are the marks of the double ridged roof which he put on it. And then that lasted for oh, 40, 50 years and Bishop Murray obviously went back to the Gothic style and he was responsible for putting the battlements back on the top again and at the same time he rebuilt the chapel so we've had a variety of chapels um, the original medieval chapel was removed and the chapel now is sited much well not much but slightly further away from the road than it was originally there was a Tudor extension and the extensions beyond that in the 19th century uh, the kitchens, the larder, the courtyard at the back, the bishop's herring house, there was a knot garden. 
uh, it's been added on to till it's really a very vast and sprawling set of buildings, isn't it? It is, yes. I mean, the original part of it is quite small. And of course part of that too, Bishop Wilson did, he extended the house with a cross wing at the end of the sort of Tudor hall, um, if you can call it that. And of course then again, just in the, the main area of the house, um, this again was part of, of what happened during um, Bishop Murray's time that the gap between the cross wing and the tower was filled in and in fact brought forward of, of the line of both of those to give two big rooms, one on the ground floor, one on the first floor. I wonder was it a comfortable place to live uh, over these centuries? I suppose some of the bishops considered it such. Um, I don't know that any of us would have considered the original medieval tower to have been very comfortable to have lived in although again probably by the standards of the time it was. I think perhaps in, in that Tudor period it was and probably also in Bishop Murray's time. Some of the bishops though found it in a pretty parlous and dilapidated state. I think Bishop Wilson found it as such. Well this seems to have been the pattern. Um, a bishop would come, find it in a bad state, he would do a lot of work on it, rebuild certain sections of it, or the new pieces as we've been talking, and um, then it would get very little done to it, presumably. When he moved, his successors probably didn't spend much time in it, tried to avoid it, or certainly to avoid spending money on it, and it would deteriorate again, and then along would come another bishop, and he decided that he would have to spend some of the monies on it and get it back into a fit state for himself. Bishop's Court is now a family home and this year after extensive restoration work the present owner Gerard Fairhurst has opened the house to the public on two days a week. After showing me around and through the chapel and such rarities as an ice house and a herring house both found to the rear of the main building Mr Fairhurst leafed through the visitors book and I asked him if it contained favourable comments. Yes, there's quite a few comments. One here from a gentleman in Douglas, and it uh, reads, Great to see this piece of Manx history finally restored and not left to deteriorate like so much Manx heritage has been before. You know, if you look through, you will see so many things. I mean, many of them are just, you know, most enjoyable and great. Um, but most of them, uh, in fact, are from, um, you know, Manx people themselves. So what sort of reaction have you had then since you decided to open to the public a couple of days a week? Are you getting good numbers of people here? We're getting quite good numbers. Uh, I mean, we're not overcrowded, but uh, the, the um, uh, nicest thing really is I think that everybody seems to enjoy what, uh, you know, what they see. Uh, I'm impressed because they, they tend to look out for me. I, they probably recognize me as being the scruffiest one here. But, uh, and. and um, yeah, they do make a point of, of uh, coming along and congratulating us on what we've done, and I think that's, that, that does make it worthwhile. Just remind me why you decided to buy Bishop's Court in the first place. Well, that's <laughs> a very good question. I mean, uh, I saw it advertised. I was involved in the Isle of Man. Um, well, when I say involved, I used to come over here on holidays with uh, you know, my family. And... Um, I actually saw it advertised in Country Life. I, I've been involved with the restoration of, um, uh, you know, p um, ancient buildings, uh, and in fact, have been a member of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings for over 26 years now. And seeing a building of this sort of calibre uh, being offered for sale uh, uh, on an island which I um, uh, would particularly like to live, and uh, you know, naturally I was interested. So it was, it was some sort of challenge then to restore it, was it? Because it was obviously in, in a desperate state when you took it over. It was in a desperate state, uh, absolutely no doubt about it at all. There were estimates flying around at the time that it would cost over half a million to put it right. Um, I didn't pay too much attention to those. My own estimate, in fact, was only £100,000, but we are talking about, this was in 78, so we're talking about a long time ago, uh, and that would probably be nearer a million pounds today. You've been listening to a special edition of Mandate, looking at Bishop's Court, which was broadcast in July 1989. And you can hear this programme again, along with lots of exclusive content from Manx Radio's first five decades as the island's public service broadcaster, by going to manxradio.com slash portal.